Hey folks, Phil the B-Man here. I'm just doing some thinking about losses and spring management and uh, dealing with the kind of uh, spring we've had. So I've got the numbers here and I thought I'd, I'd take you through it. And I want to say this, uh, I mean, Manitoba beekeepers and, and I think all across Western Canada, we've really had a uh, a time of it this winter and spring. The winter was, uh, you know, a very classic Canadian winter. Lots of uh, long, cold stretches and very deep snow. And it uh, just hasn't given up on us. Uh, we've basically had winter conditions right up until the last, well, really until today, uh, 1st of May. So um, the wind's out howling out there. It's not as cold as it has been, but uh, heavy wind out there blowing the pails off the hives and flipping lids over. And So, we're struggling. And uh, I want this to be a bit of a story about how I plan to, to pull back from that. I know there's lots of beekeepers out there that are thinking about how to manage their own uh, situations. I'm not going to tell you how to do your thing. I'm just going to sh share with you what I plan and the experiences that I've had in the past. So first of all, the bad news. Now, uh, these are uh, numbers from our, we have a, a overwinter mortality insurance program here in Manitoba. A beekeeper can voluntarily subscribe, pay an insurance premium and insure their hives. Uh, it's not cheap but uh it's it's worth it i and, and i i know the numbers of beekeepers that subscribe to that is relatively low and um i think uh you know i don't want to it's not it's not good to, to to sort of what about uh but uh at least i'm uh, i'm i'm in that program so we had the insurance adjusters out to count the deads and the way they evaluate is to count as dead anything that's sort of not viable. Now some of those are savable so these numbers look way worse than they are. So it's dead if it has uh, two frames or less of bees and um, then if it's counted as weak if it has three or four frames of bees and strong if it has five frames or more of bees. Now, when we were checking my hives, it was cold and uh, those hives were tight. So there's probably a little bit of, of uh, generosity to these, to these numbers from, from the insurance claim perspective. If we'd come back when it was 20 degrees, some of those hives might have, could easily expand a few percent. So anyway, when you count it all up, this is by site. You don't care about the sites, but uh, the totals out of 1189. Oh, by the way, I, um, I got two columns here. One is the totals that were recorded by my adjuster and another one is uh, totaling up the counts. And you can see in one, call, one row here, I've got a slight adjustment to make. Uh, we're out by five. That's why that's highlighted there. But uh, uh, 1189 is the number of colonies I submitted for uh, adjustment and we're put in the winter. And of those uh, darn near half of them, 48% is counted as dead or critically weak. And so that's that's not good news. There's no way around that. Um, relatively few of them counted as weak. Um, and I would suggest that in part is of these dead ones, there was a bunch that were marked weak when I would first put them out and, you know, peeked under the lid and, and marked it as weak. So the very first chance I had, I could get back and fix those hives. But that, you know, it just kept snowing and storming and, and so on. So never got a chance to fix those and they just went downhill. So I've got a whole bunch of dead hives or that are hives that are just nearly dead that were marked as, that could have easily been saved if if the spring had given me a chance. And relatively few weak ones because um, 
you know, the hives that had enough critical mass of bees were pretty much fine, and then everything else was just going downhill. So, I mean, that sort of five frame or more versus three frames or less kind of cutoff, that's pretty accurate because um, uh, the ones that had five frames, they're good. The what? The ones that were a little bit less than that really started to trend towards the non-viable hives. So anyway, so oh, relatively few of them in this weak category. And a lot of those are really going to make a decent, you know, nuke. They're not going to be a production hive without some help, but they're viable hives. And I'll have to, and then I've got about 37% of these hives that are strong. So when I want to project, okay, what is my operation going to look like uh, on the 1st of July after the spring work is done? And sorry for the cat, my teaching cat here interrupting everything. Uh, so what I did was I said, let's assume that of these deads, and this is my kind of anecdotal observation, that about a third of those are going to need a significant boost. I'm going to have to take nearly a nuke's worth of bees out of the strong to boost those those deaths. So uh, the first thing I did was count those up. So just looking at the total of the dead, about a third of them is 160. And then, so I figure if I take 160 off of the strong, that leaves me with about 277 hives that are going to be a position to give me a split. So, you know, I got to start, you know, thinking about ordering those queens, uh, lining up the supplies and so on for that. And so that, that's a good number to work with. I'm going to somewhere between 250 and 300 possible splits. Uh, and then I also have my nukes, which also took a bit of a beating. Uh, showing as now the nukes are rated slightly weaker so we have uh you know two frames or less instead of three frames or less is kind of dead weak is um and so, so about half of them are strong and most of those strong ones are looking really good they're about five frames of bees that box is full and then um about 10 percent of them are you know kind of half two and a half, three frames, and then the dead ones are either just a sliver of bees. And sometimes that's because the other side is strong. They're two, I call them my split hives or my twins. Uh, one side is strong and got lots of heat to share. And so the other side can kind of hang on even if um, it's really struggling. So anyway, so there's there. So then if I add up, uh, you know, I'm going to have to take some of those bees to restock the ones that are dead and so on. But I think I can get about, my best guess is, to take uh, about half of the 187 strong. Half of them will be used to fill the holes. The other half can be made for nukes. So I end up with my hives repopulated, those twins repopulated, plus a spare 90-odd nukes. So that puts me... Uh, into a basically darn near where I started uh, or left off last fall, back barely to my hive count. And that's kind of assuming all this work gets done and the weather uh, straightens out and, and lets us get this stuff done. And that's not going to be easy. These bee yards are saturated. Um, we're going we're gonna to struggle with, with access to the sites. We're going to struggle with all sorts of things. Um, so, you know, this is, but, but, you know, I, I'm optimistic that we can recover. Uh, and that's kind of like, okay, one year of recovery. Uh, and that's, you know, let's face it, we're looking at counted as less than half. And there's beekeepers in, in Western Canada that have losses that are reported is, is quite a bit higher than that. So I wanted to share a little bit about, uh, I've, I've, had, I've had my butt kicked before. This is not my first rodeo. Um, and there are some factors 
to, to rebuilding that are worth thinking about. First of all, when it comes to building up your hive numbers, there really is no, well, in Canada, we have restrictions on importing bees from other countries. And so that's a, and especially with uh, reduced travel and, f and air uh, freight and so on, so supply chain doesn't support importing lots of bees by air from countries that uh, can, we can import to. And uh, so, uh, you know, just, just spending money to solve the problem isn't really an option for most of us. So if we can't spend money, uh, how how do you get how do you get your bees back? And a li a, there really is no better way to do that than to to build your operation the way you did in the first place, which is to you know whether you started with one hive or fifty, uh, and you when the bees are good you make splits, and when they're not you stick with what you've got, and and you and you build it back up. Now, the problem with that is once your operation's grown to a certain size, you you have fixed costs, you have obligations, you have fin you know both financial and personal obligations. You've got employees you need to pay. You've got your bank manager wants uh, the the obligations met and so on. And so, you know, going back to hobby beekeeper status and building it back up again. Ooh, that's rough. And uh, there are some some other factors that Canadian beekeepers, and I'm, I'm, I'll speak uh, only to the Canadian uh, situation. There are some some programs that uh, that we should you should know how they work in order to optimize your recovery. And so I'll talk about that very briefly. And so if you're, if you're from other places in the world, you're welcome to listen in and hear us, hear us try to support each other. If, uh, if you're from Western Canada or Ontario and you've had your butt kicked, uh, I made some mistakes last time around. And so I'll, I'll just share some thoughts here so that you can add into your own consideration. Uh, I mentioned the insurance. And um, the insurance program count, uh, insures you for your own historical rate. And so when you take a claim like I'm going to, uh, that's going to reduce uh, my future protection. And uh, so probably as beekeepers, we might want to reach out to government and say, look, you know, everyone, you know, this is an extraordinary year. The, the weather kicked us in the butt. Maybe we need to think about uh, prorating that or, or something so that uh, the insurance program, they're only going to cover half of your B losses, paying the premium starts to look marginal. My personal feeling would be that I would want to uh, really double down on my beekeeping and build my, uh, my historic rate back up. And hopefully there can be a bit of a sunset on that. So it's not counting against me for the rest of my life. Um, so the, that insurance program pays out, um, if the historical average rate, uh, they use, if you're new to the program last year, you would have got 65%, uh, as expected survivability, and then they would pay you out uh, for every lost hive based on that. Um... They, and then they discount all that by 10%. So you, you get 90% of, of what you would get. So in my case, it's going to be a significant claim, and that'll help a ton. And, uh, and I really feel for those that maybe opted out of the program or maybe used, you know, the program uh, in previous years and so it was no longer covering enough. That's going to be tough. Um, Another program that most uh, that's sort of for all of agriculture and beekeepers uh, should consider being part of it is AgriStability, which is a uh, disaster uh, program designed to offset losses in income. So that um, 
and you can join that kind of after the fact. It's um, the way it works is if you've been filing uh, revenue, if you've been filing your taxes as a agriculture producer, and then you have a drop in income, then it'll offset that sum. Uh, and so it's a bit like unemployment insurance. If you have a history of, of earning, they'll make up some of the difference. And um, that program works on a what they call an Olympic average so that your highest and lowest of the previous five years is dropped. And then the, the remaining three years are used to calculate your average income and they pay you out a portion of that. When you think about how that program works, you think, oh, actually, when they start dropping those years, I don't want this gradual recovery. I actually want to take all the pain in one year. And that way, um, then the uh, I get my in, you know in, uh, income insurance through that program. If I do it over a couple years, that reduces the payout and it reduces the, your protection in future disasters. So you kind of want to say, well, maybe you don't make much of a crop this year. And you, I would encourage you to talk to your financial advisor, your accountant, or, or look up uh, AgriStability online. I think I have it queued up here. Uh, yeah. So, you know, you there are pretty good fact sheets for uh, figuring out. You can, uh, you can calculate your losses a little bit. There is a... Um, uh, an estimator, you could pump in your uh, your guesstimate as to your numbers and, and figure out what kind of uh, payout you might get. There is a bit of a risk to that, that um, you would certainly not want to count on it too much. And it also comes kind of late. Like, So what would happen is you would say, that's it. We're no longer honey producers in 2022. The best we can do is build up our bee numbers as best we can. And you, you know, you sacrifice honey production, you bust down every hive into the minimal size nuke that would build up to a winterable colony. And uh, the small amount of honey you get might be almost a byproduct. Uh, that would maximize your agri-stability claim because you'd have relatively low income but you would only get that uh, you would you know do that in 2022 file your tax return in 2023 and then after you know the computers up at government uh, house uh, grind away for a while and and uh, you know, the check might come. My, my experience is it's been almost the fall of the following year. That's a challenge because um, you might have a fantastic year in 2023 and then, but, and then that, that benefit counts as income. So, uh, you know, you'll need to do some, some work with your, your tax planning, your accountant, and, or if you educate yourself about how to use a carry back to have the loss that you have in 2022 uh, applied against uh, a higher income in 2023. So that's uh, something to think about for agri-stability. You want uh, to optimize your benefit from that program. A one year disaster is better than two or three years of pain. Uh, and that's a mistake I honestly made uh, last year. I, I was thinking more about my own cash flow, and we, after a, a big hit, it took us a couple years to get kind of back on our feet. And uh, I, I really didn't get much out of that program because I'd made kind of an okay crop and then kind of an okay crop, and it dragged down my, my risk of, uh, protection without uh, giving me any benefit. Uh, that's more than five years ago for me now, so I've, I'm, you know, my 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 coverage is is okay. Um, 
And then there is also in Canada the Agri-Invest program. If you've been a participant in that in the past, you have kind of a kitty maybe that's saved up. Uh, that's a program for those of you who don't know that uh, is incentivizes uh, uh, farm producers to put money away for a rainy day by providing some matching of that money. You put money in the bank, the government will top it up a bit. And so you, you do have that to draw on uh, if necessary. So uh, from a financial management point of view, um, you know, beekeepers have had a couple years of pretty good prices. Um, there should be uh, ways of leveraging that to cover your butt while you rebuild your hives. Uh, but it's going to feel like a huge opportunity loss because, you know, honey price has never been better to, you know, to take this year to rebuild when, you know, prices are so good. It's going gonna, it's gonna to drive you nuts. And I guess that's where I want to end this is to say um, most of us feel that being beekeepers is part of who we are and have our hives die, to have our hives not succeed, gets you right there. And I, there's no way around that. It's going gonna, it's gonna to bug you every night for quite a while that... Uh, you know, the, the winter kicked your butt, the mites kicked your butt, and there's no way around that. Um, all I can say is you, you can get through this. Uh, it's, it's not going to be easy and it's not going to be fun. Um, and uh, the rest of us are, are in, in okay shape is no consolation. I remember, uh, you know, I was moaning on social media about the condition of my hives quite a few years ago, might be eight or ten years ago. And, uh, you know, some people thought they were helping up by pointing out that their neighbor's hives were just fine. And <laughs> that, that did not console me at all. It was probably even a little bit of a err situation. So, um, you know... The fact that there's lots of beekeepers out there that have really struggled this year uh, should tell you that it's not just you. That um, you know, if anyone thinks that they're a, a sort of a moral failure for failing their bees, I I don't see that that's a reasonable position to take. You, it is uh, something that many of us are going through, and even I I really am shocked by the condition of my hives after a month of of neglect because of the weather. Um, I guess uh, good news, silver lining, it turns out they need us. Um, you put them out in the field and you can't do anything for them because the weather won't let you open the lid. The hives don't succeed on their own. So we got to get out there and do the best we can. Those bees need us. Uh, the sun's going to shine. Let's get out there and, and do the best we can for them. And the but so in summary, uh, when you're making your plans, do some thinking about both the short and the long-term effects on your cash flow and your business management and include the available programming from government support that's relevant to you. Uh, think about how uh, whether a short claim or, a, or a, a long process would be better for the programs that are relevant to you. Think about how uh, that, that'll work out. Um, the, the, the initial temptation is to grit your teeth and, and uh, you know, do nothing uh, except what will be sort of just feel right from a beekeeping perspective. Do consider... Uh, the available support programs that Canada has for you and plan within uh, the guidelines that uh, those offer. So that's my thinking uh, on how to deal with losses, both from a financial management perspective uh, 
and uh, Tiger the cat, the teaching cat, she bailed out when things got uh, a little touchy feely here. But um, the I, I remember, you know, eight or ten years ago, thinking, oh, maybe I should just give this up. Uh, this is hard, and uh, when you've been you know, beekeeping. You know, I am Phil the Bee Man. Um, when you realize maybe I'm not that great a beekeeper after all, holy smokes, that's a, that's a crisis of confidence. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, those varroa mites—they're just—they just, just want to sh you know, destroy us all. And all we can do is fight back the best we can. Um, so, good luck. Sunny days are coming. Let's make the most of them. Um, it'll feel like a huge opportunity lost to not produce a huge crop when honey's three dollars a pound. If you have a small crop, it's okay to have it on a year when prices are high and it might help the cash flow a little bit. So I, you know, that's the only consolation I can offer is you don't need at three bucks a pound. You don't need a huge crop to maybe meet your obligations. So uh, that's enough uh, jibber jabber for me on, uh, on this. We'll hopefully have videos coming inside the hive, which is what everyone wants to see. And uh, we'll leave the business management to, to next winter. Thanks a lot, everyone. Have a great day.